Ok, ci siamo. Eh, buonasera a tutti, eh, a tutte e tutti. Benvenuti alla seconda giornata delle Notti Bianche sul Divano, eh, organizzato da studenti per Udu Padova. Um, insieme a me ci sono Sofia, rappresentante degli studenti per Udu Padova, e Ken, Kenneth, Ro, uh, Kenneth R. Rosen, giornalista e reporter di guerra. E questa è l'ottava edizione delle uh, Notti Bianche sul Liviano, in realtà, però purtroppo non potendo farlo dal vivo, date le, la, 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 la situazione in cui ci troviamo, siamo costretti a, a svolgere questo festival online. E, beh, lascerei la parola a Sofia, che introdurrà il nostro ospite, e vi dico già che tutta la conferenza sarà in inglese. So, uh, Kenneth, let me introduce you to our virtual public. Um, Ken is a senior editor and correspondent at Newsweek based in Italy. He is a contributing writer at Wired and the author of two books of narrative nonfiction, Bullet for Vest and Troubled. Uh, previously, he spent six years at um, staff at the New York Times, and uh, he is a two time finalist for the Livingston Award in International Reporting. He also received the Bayo Calvado Normandy Award for War Correspondent for his reporting on Iraq in 2018 and was a finalist for his reporting on Syria on 2019. Uh, he has written for the New Yorker, the New York Times magazines, the Atlantic, the Arthur, and probably others newspapers. Uh, Ken's work has been supported by the McDowell Colony, the Banff Center for Arts and Creativity, uh, the Policy Center on Crisis Reporting, and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and probably many, many other foundations and institutions. So is everything right? Did it say any fake news about you? <laughs> no fake news. I really appreciate the introduction and thanks for having me. Thank you. So um, we, would like, we would like to start the conversation with you asking about the, um, your book, Bulletproof Vest. Um, sometimes um, the name given to certain object Um, doesn't really represent the, in an accurate way, the object they're described. Uh, in your book, you explain um, from the beginning that the bulletproof vest is actually bullet resistant. So my question is, are there any other word that um, are, where is used an inaccurate term for describe them in the language of war? Yeah, I, um, I appreciate the question. I, I wanted to start just by sort of underlying, underscoring what I meant by the bulletproof vest being bullet resistant rather than bulletproof. Um, I, it's, I think it's a common misconception to say that something or someone is bulletproof. In fact, a lot of the equipment that military and journalists wear can only protect them up to a certain point. So whether it be a nine millimeter pistol round, maybe shot three times, won't protect you against a larger rifle. Um, so there are different grades and different protective qualities to uh, both equipment and uh, fabrics. So in this instance, uh, bulletproof vests. Um, you have a question about what some, are some other things and other terms used that are maybe not necessarily on its face accurate. Um, I guess we can talk about personal protective equipment, PPE, which we've read a lot about in the news uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak and pandemic. Um, you know, it's a personal protective equipment is gives this idea that it protects the person um, and, and keeps the person safe because it's a personal object, something that you keep for yourself um, and that you use on your own. But as we've come to learn with this pandemic, we realize that the personal protective equipment is actually in a lot of ways to protect other people. Um, we wear the masks when we go out in public, not necessarily because we're afraid of contracting the disease, but because we might infect other people by being asymptomatic. Um, so that's one example um, in just today's world. I guess another example in uh, war, you asked about wartime specifically, um, this idea of a front line in today's uh, media coverage or just wars in general is a fallacy. Um, there's no such thing really as a front line. It's really just a, a, a way to um, demarcate 
an area where fighting is occurring between two sides. So in, in the instances in places that I've covered in Syria and Iraq, it was against the Islamic State. Um, but there's never really a safe place anymore. There's no real front line in this global war on terrorism. There's a lot of places where you can go and, and feel ostensibly safe and secure, but uh, terrorism happens at any hour, at any place, um, and you always have to remain conscious and, and cautious. So I, I think front line and this idea of safety or secure zones is, is a bit um, of a stretch, but it does help us feel more secure in different areas. We would feel um, better about being at our own country She's embassy during a crisis, though maybe that embassy would be the target of some other violence, but we're not sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Cam. Um, uh, what I want to ask you is, uh, mm, you've been a war reporter, um, and the journalists started uh, doing war report uh, during the Second World War. Mm, since then, um, it, this uh, way, to um, this job changed a lot. What I'm asking you is, uh, if during the Second World War till the Vietnam, um, it was uh, talking, uh, um, being a tool for uh, the propaganda of uh, own state, um, what's now the purpose of a war journalist? Well, I think to go back a little bit further, um, in World War I, a lot of international correspondence with the wire services, uh, UPI or um, the Associated Press, were actually invited by the German, the German forces, the Nazi German forces, to be embedded with their troops to show the um, and champion the sort of narrative that they were um, you know, doing good or, or, or being humane or not causing any trouble and abiding by the laws of, of war. Um, so there was for a long time a sort of understanding between journalists and uh, countries who were at war that journalists were meant to be impartial, that they were supposed to be there to cover an event for everyone to see in a newsy way. Um, around World War II, like you noted, there's sort of um, journalists who chose sides because they were only given access to their own country's forces. Um, we think of Hemingway and we think of um, um, uh, other journalists who were embedded with American forces. Um, I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on it. Um, Martha, um, um, his wife was also embedded with uh, forces and, and, and covered the wars from uh, their American standpoints. Um, George Orwell, for another example, wrote the homage to Catalonia, which was about his personal account of fighting in the Republican army in uh, uh, the Spanish Civil War. And that's a, a, a really full account of what's happening on both sides. And I think that he took into account different um, aspects of war that were sort of shared between forces. One of which was that the fighting forces weren't necessarily against one another on, on its face. They were um, representing their governments who were fighting, right? So that the young men were still fighting uh, a cause that may, they might not have been really um, apt to fight, but were doing it because they were instructed to. Um, the, the start of my book comes begins with an epigraph from Vasily Grossman, who was a correspondent during World War II as well. Um, and, and he had some incredible reporting that was um, both objective, but also surreal and, and showed in a lot of ways the, the brutalities of war. And I think that's the most uh, poignant kind of reporting is to show that no matter what side you're on, it's still a brutal thing for a lot of people to, to endure, to go through, uh, whether it be the civilians who are inadvertently um, killed or uh, suffer through, the, through the, the aftermath of war, whether it be uh, broken utilities or, or, or low food supplies. Um, so I think the, the role of the, uh, the, the war correspondent hasn't changed all that much. I think that our access has been uh, changed, or what we can access is a lot different. Um, during the American invasion of Iraq in 2000 uh, in 2002, there were a lot of reporters embedded with the American military, and we see all these images coming out of um, Baghdad and sort of the um, the siege from the desert, which was in part propaganda, right? They were showing how the American forces were getting making good on a promise to end terrorism after the attacks of September 11th. Uh, but ever since then, it's very hard to get. Um, embeds, as we call it, um, uh, uh, tours with the actual troops themselves for this very reason. They're trying to cut back on the ability of reporters to um, report on what militaries are doing, in part because of security issues. Uh, they don't want to expose where troops are located, what troop movements are happening. Um, 
but I, I don't know if it's if it's necessarily all propaganda. I think there's some now still today um, with certain news organizations who are government run, government funded, um, state media organizations is what I'm referring to. But by and large, the people that I've worked with and the people that uh, I've reported with are, are out there doing a, a really tough job um, trying to bring to light stories from these places that we see a lot on Twitter or Facebook or hear about in the news, but don't really understand quite a lot about. Um, so we're, we're there trying to bring out stories that are not necessarily making it to the front pages of newspapers, to the big spreads of magazines, um, and to help readers and the general public understand the devastation and the consequences of war. Thank you. So um, can you talk a little bit about the civilians? I would like to ask you, um, what kind of relationship did you have with the local people on the war area where you were? And also how much the communication difficulties due to the lack of knowledge of the language, the local language, influenced your experiences in the different area where you were? Um, I talk a lot about this in the book, um, about how I feel like an outsider not being able to communicate so fluently. Um, I feel that way also in Italy when I'm not able to communicate so well um, when I go out for groceries. Um, but it didn't affect it too much. Um, I, of course, I felt a little, a, a little removed and not necessarily a part of what was happening, a bit privileged in that way. But I travel with what are called fixers and interpreters who um, help me arrange uh, interviews and do translation for me on the spot and help me navigate social customs that I wouldn't otherwise be aware of uh, on immediately arriving in a new country. One of those customs that I kept breaking over and over again in Iraq was um, crossing or not cross or crossing my legs while in meetings. We're not supposed to, you're not supposed to cross your legs one over the other. It's a sort of sign of um, disrespect. Um, so there's small things like this that make it challenging to navigate. But by and large, the people that I interviewed and spoke with and um, who helped me with my stories were kind and gracious and, 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 and super uh, well-spoken and, and helped me um, understand a lot about the war against the Islamic State that I didn't understand. And they were very eager to tell their stories and, and have the world understand what they were going through, having been under the control of this caliphate for uh, several years. Thank you. Well, um, before you talked about the, the rawness of war, um, what I'm going to ask you is um, the media uh, transpose uh, how raw war is uh, in, in different ways, movies, uh, TV series, um, talk about Generation Kill, or um, documentaries like uh, Restrepo. And what I'm going to ask you is, um, how a journalist could write about um, what he sees, uh, about the erroneous he sees, avoiding to turn this whole thing into an exhibition, into, into a show. Yeah, I think you're you're referring to this sort of glorification of war, you know, making it a, a something that's more entertainment than it is reality. And I think there is a there is a worry about that every time I sit down to write anything about um, about conflict, armed conflict. Um, I think a lot of people operating today, whether it be filmmakers or journalists, have have learned to um, step back when it comes to writing about. Um, these conflicts and to give as best they can just the facts. Um, we try to avoid what is called editorializing and sensationalizing in journalism. Um, we don't like to use um, nouns or verbs that would sort of uh, color the, the reporting or the writing in such a way that would lean to the one side or the other of the argument, whether it be to you know uh, glorify the Islamic State or glorify the, the vanquishers of the Islamic State, but to tell a story directly and, and, and truthfully as you see it. Um, seeing it as its own sort of uh, subjective lens, right? We all have our own personal um, subjectivity and our own biases that we bring to it. But if we maintain a, a, a singular approach that is honest and, and, and um, not anything more than we can see or know, I think that's the best we can do to avoid glorification. Um, you know, it's a it's an important thing to to cover war to begin with. I mean, to to remember that we've lost so many people to senseless violence, to nations going to war um, over, you know, 
what did we see earlier this year? An airstrike that killed a high level Iranian general. Th these things have consequences. And I feel that we must be reminded over and over um, to be careful in the actions of our people and of our government um, to not cause more harm and more death and destruction to people who might not deserve it. Um, so there is some value into in 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 the I guess the Hollywoodization of some of uh, some of these these things. But I think a lot of people like Restrepo, um, you're referencing um, Sebastian Younger's piece. Um, you know that was just straight straight reportage of him staying with a bunch of Af uh, U.S. military in Afghanistan's Korangal Valley. And uh, there's nothing more vivid and truthful than just turning on a camera and letting people, you know, do their own business. Um, that's pretty telling. Um, we, uh, we have no questions for the moment from from the public. I would like to ask. You're out of you questions. I would like. I would like to ask you something about the training you did before leaving for Iraq or Syria. Um, if it was um, really, I mean, enough useful and if you were uh, ready to be there when you leave. Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, you're referring to the hostile environment and trauma first aid courses that I took. Um, it was a three day course that I took before I left um, the United States to go to Iraq for the first time. And they did prepare me in a lot of ways. They they helped me understand sort of the situations I was going into, what I would need to look out for, um, to be mindful of my surroundings in case things were going south and to um, appreciate um, different scenarios that might arise that I didn't necessarily consider ahead of time. Uh, for example, um, I hadn't realized that the military was often using what are called like radio jammers to disable uh, drones that were being flown by the Islamic State. And one of the consequences of, of using those devices was the inability to unlock and lock a car remotely through, through your keys. So that you always needed a car that had an actual key to get into the door, otherwise your vehicle would be disabled. So there are things like that that I wasn't necessarily thinking about um, different ways to position myself um, when I was on the front line. Um, so those that prepared me in a lot of ways. It helped me uh, per, put together a trauma kit um, in case I got uh, hurt or one of my colleagues was hurt. But uh, overall, it was really a sense of, and this is sort of the, 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 the whole premise of the book, is that those classes were great, but they made me feel safe. And that was the most important part, that this idea of safety, this idea of security through the bulletproof vest, through the first aid kit, um, through the training courses, through research, through speaking with a lot of people ahead of time, that prepared me in a way that made me feel safe in ways that my bulletproof vest could only protect me so much. Um, so I was still anxious and nervous um, when I went there for my first uh, reporting trip for a few weeks. I was nervous the next trip and the several trips after. Um, and I think that that's a valuable valuable feeling. It's an emotion that means you're highly aware and highly attuned with what's going on around you. And that can only make you safer. Um, you know, getting cocky and getting, uh, believing that you're safe and, and, and secure is, is, is a surefire um, a recipe for disaster. Okay, we got a, a question from uh, Alberto. You wrote about safety, about PPEs. But what does really mean safety, both in your job, in conflict zones, and normal life? Is it actually a cabin in the hoods? In the hoods? <laughs> I appreciate the question, Alberto. Um, for me, it's a cabin in the woods. Um, you know, this, this notion of distance, of emotional distance from the things that I was seeing and the people I was meeting, um, and the experiences that I was having was very important. Um, there are correspondents who live in these conflict zones year round and they do incredible work and, and work that I could only hope to one day achieve. Uh, but for me coming back and, and, and which you, what we call, um, um, sort of, uh, sitting with my own thoughts and stabilizing my own emotions and thinking about the stories that I was writing and making sure I was doing everything properly was important to me. Decompression, you know, coming down from something that was a that was a high feeling of, of tension and anxiety. Um, 
so it was for me a, a, a cabin in the woods. I sit now talking to you from a little shed um, that I have in Northern Italy where I do a, a lot of my writing and reporting um, and I feel safe here. Um, am I actually safe? I, maybe not, um, but I feel like I'm safe and, and the sense of home, the sense of uh, you know community is also a way people feel safe as, as one who goes back home often does. Um, PPE in today's world, uh, you know, we have to go in Italy, as you all know, we have to go to grocery stores with masks on and with gloves and uh, hand sanitizer, the carts and clean the carts. And um, are we really protecting ourselves when, you know, eventually we're going to take the gloves off and we're going to touch a steering wheel and a door handle and maybe not clean ourselves? Full? We're not totally safe, but doing these things makes us feel safe and it protects other people. And that's important, too, because we're being conscious and we're thinking about ways to be safe. We're thinking about other people. Um, we're thinking about how to minimize our risk and, uh, and our, um, you know, our, our own safety. Thank you. Um, well, about uh, your experience in uh, Iraq uh, and Syria, um, what kind of relationship uh, um, you established with um, with the soldiers you lived with, you you talk with, and other journalists you met, also with them, um, how could how did you relate with them? How did you share your stories? Uh, how also how could you find the stories? Uh, two different two different questions. So the first question: um, How did I relate to and how did I spend time with the soldiers and journalists I was with overseas? Um, I was very much, and I still very much am, a cabin in the woods kind of person, as Alberto uh, pointed out. Um, when I was overseas, I kept to myself. Um, I had meals with the with the soldiers. I had meals with with journalists, and I slept and bunked with uh, military personnel, and drove around with military personnel in Humvees and and uh, jeeps. But um, I, I wanted to remain sort of a step back. I wanted to be an observer. I didn't want to be. Um, the American that you can chill with and talk with and 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 shoot the shit with. I just wanted to really get a feel for what was going on. And uh, one time I was in uh, Mosul, I actually came across a, a, a soldier who knew a friend of mine, a colleague of mine back in New York. Um, and that was a sort of surprising thing to see that it was a very close-knit uh, community of us all traveling around these war zones and reporting on um, these big stories, big international stories. Um, the second question about how do I come up with the stories? I, that's a age old question that I remember asking when I was uh, in um, in my undergraduate college, um, trying to figure out how to how to frame a story, how to come up with a story. And um, the best advice that I could ever give is just to keep reading. And um, as you read through news stories, as you read through magazines and books and, and, and try to fill yourself with a lot of knowledge about what's going on in the world, you'll inevitably start to have questions. And you'll end up wondering why something is one way and not the other, or how could this person do this and not that? Um, and these questions end up uh, fueling different ideas for different stories. And um, you report one story and then another idea comes based on something that you could not include in one story or that didn't fit with the theme of the story. Or someone tells you one thing for a different story but makes for an even better separate story. So you sort of follow the rabbit trail and go down the rabbit hole in that way. Um, for the uh, for one story I did out of Iraq, I just had a very simple question. You know, what were the international security forces and NGOs doing with the dead bodies of ISIS fighters? Where were they going? Um, who was taking care of them? Um, it seemed like a crazy question because nobody liked ISIS. Nobody liked in the Western world. And uh, I kept reading about in newspaper articles and wire reports that there were bodies strewn everywhere, that they were all over the place. Um, so I was curious about who was taking care of them and if they were being taken care of. We knew that a lot of those fighters were uh, foreign fighters. They came from Germany, they came from Turkey, they came from Italy, they came from America, from Europe. Um, and so that some of these people were Western um, Westerners who deserved a proper burial. Um, and so I just wanted to go out there and figure out um, the answer to that question. And that's how a lot of stories um, come about. Thank you. Yeah, we have another question from Laura. Uh, in the book, you also wrote about how Clever was invented, but was it quite a mistake? 
Uh, thank you, Laura, for the question. I think what Laura is referring to is um, Stephanie Kowalik's discovery of the fiber now that we now know as Kevlar. Kevlar itself is a material compound. It's uh, often used as a as a name for uh, facsimile for all types of bulletproofing, but it's not necessarily the truth for all bulletproofing. There's different types, different products, different companies making bulletproofing. Um, so I think what you're referring to is that discovery of Kevlar, this, this polymer compound um, that a scientist at DuPont in America uh, discovered through trial and error. So she did discover it through asking a similar question, like these stories that I was describing. She wanted to figure out a way to help uh, reduce the gas mileage of cars to create a stronger tire that didn't uh, tear so easily, that didn't wear so easily so that people could save money on gas. And she tried hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to come up with something that was stronger than rubber that would still offer the properties of rubber, the resilience of rubber. Um, and she came to find um, Kevlar. And lo and behold, it had a lot of other uh, good properties. You know, they use it in a lot of safety equipment. It's used in sailboats for the sails. They use it in gloves for cooking. Um, it's a really good protective fiber, but it also has um, bullet resistant properties. Okay. Let's go with the next. Uh, why did you choose to leave your country and be a war reporter? That's a good question. Uh, tough question. Um, I. I went on a very short trip for my first time uh, to Iraq uh, to write this story that I was describing earlier about the um, bodies of dead ISIS fighters. Um, and I felt compelled to tell that story. It was um, one I had thought about um, um, over the course of news coverage increasing about the fall of the Islamic State, about Peshmerga advancing on the Islamic State in Mosul um, and the American forces helping out these, uh, these Kurdish forces in country. And I felt the need to explore that idea. And I wasn't seeing it reported elsewhere. And I pitched a few magazines. And um, several magazines were very interested in, 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 in supporting the story and sending me overseas. And I ended up going with one um, who would support that trip and, and let me tell that story. And um, it wasn't so much leaving my country as it was um, you know, bringing to light a story that I felt needed telling. Um, now, of course, I left. Uh, the U.S. to go live in Italy now, and um, that's a totally different, um, totally different arena. Uh, it's not necessarily a conflict zone, but with the recent pandemic, it feels a lot like um, you know a place of um, of uncertainty. There's a lot of um, worry and fear about the economy, and um, there's a lot of familiar feelings there. So I think um, I think that you know your home is always one place that you align with the country that you're born in, but um, home can be anywhere where your family is. And for me, that's in Italy. And um, I feel safe and secure here. And um, I don't really know if leaving a country is the right term. I'm, I'm always coming back to the United States and, and, and still an American citizen and uh, hopefully an Italian citizen here in a, here in a couple of months. So um, I think uh, it's good to branch out. It's definitely good, especially for college students. Um, if you could take a year and, and, and try to do something new outside your major or um, explore a country that you haven't been to, maybe when all the travel opens up again, um, take on a different career that you might not have uh, thought of before. Those are valuable assets for when you grow up and, and, and try to navigate the world. Okay. Well, Sophia? Yeah, we don't have any other question from our public, but um, I would like to ask you, um, which is like what usually people ask you when you tell them you are a war reporter or you have been in Iraq, in Syria during the war? Oh, I, I try to avoid it. <laughs> um, I try to not mention anything. Of course, people are familiar with the work that I've done as far as my family goes or friends go. Um, but generally, I try to just tell people I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, and um, you know I've been to a, um, a war zone and I've, I've traveled here and there, but I don't really bring it up, um, mostly because it's hard to talk about because people wanna know these, like, um, um, like you said earlier, people wanna know these fascinating, um, exciting stories about war and dodging bullets and, and, and it's, not, it's not exciting and it's, it's not fun and it shouldn't be um, sort of looked at as, 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 as something uh, to aspire to. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's violent and it's, it's, it's not beneficial for every side involved. Um, so I try to avoid the topic, 
but uh, it doesn't inevitably come up, especially when you write a book about it. Thank you. We got another question from the public. What is the most difficult side of your job and which one the most satisfying? Um, appreciate the question. Um, the most difficult part of the job is um, sort of the planning and the access. Um, it's hard to get to a lot of these countries. It's hard to get to a lot of these places. And, and when you're there, you need a lot of permissions and documents and paperwork and locals who know the customs. Um, so I rely heavily on what we what we call fixers, these these uh, local journalists or um, translators, uh, interpreters who can who can help navigate those situations and um, planning for a trip, planning for a big story always takes a lot of time, a um, couple months at least to get the visas, to get the permissions, um, to plan out my interviews and to know where I'm going and when. Um, and uh, then it takes me a very short time to write the piece. So it all it all ends very quickly, but uh, the hardest part is that planning, that, that, that several months, uh, several weeks ahead of time before I'm able to go uh, report in a new country or report from a new place. Um, what's the most satisfying is um, seeing the change that comes from writing. Um, a piece I wrote out of Syria on uh, several men who were digging up the mass graves buried by the Islamic State received a lot of attention last year. Um, a lot of NGOs pledged more money to the men who are losing their funding. Uh, people wanted to make a documentary about them to tell their story and to show the hardships of the civilian population in Raqqa after the um, incessant bombing and airstrikes that hit the city uh, to dismantle the Islamic State. So seeing this sort of public reaction, seeing people responding to something I wrote, not necessarily for the writing or, or for me being the author behind it, but but for the subjects themselves and and seeing those people receive due attention is is, is gratifying beyond all means. Okay, thank you. Um, I got a question for you. Uh, it's about um, obviously, obviously, you got to find um, the sources for your stories, and to do so, you also have to um, contact different people, the fixers, for example. And um, I want to ask you if uh, um, have you ever feared to be sold out to some uh, warlords or sort of. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, um, I've, it's always in the back of my mind. There, I've had a friend, um, Michael Scott Moore, who wrote a book about his captivity by Somali pirates after he flew into uh, Mogadishu, and that has that his story has always plagued me. The story of um, countless number of journalists who've fallen prey to. Um, you know, believing best intentions of, of, of fixers or locals. Um, uh, you know, you do your best to mitigate those, 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 um, you mitigate that from happening, from being with the wrong people at the wrong time, you know, from uh, entering areas that you know might be hot spots for uh, that sort of activity, um, sticking to a designated route, not trying to veer off and go places where you're not supposed to go or where there might not be any support for you in case something does go wrong. Um, but I take extra steps to make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. Um, some steps that I won't discuss over video, but um, a lot of things go into the planning of these trips and a lot of resources are, are behind me when I when I do go out and report. So there's a feeling of safety in that way. There's, there's people who are watching, there are people who are taking note of where I am and who I'm with and um, giving me good contacts and making sure that I'm not making those mistakes. Uh, beyond the fixers, there's this whole international group of journalists who are working together to um, give each other sources, to, to vet people, to make sure that they're not, um, you know, of, of a criminal element. Um, so there's there's always a freelance group of, of journalists who are there to, to support me as well. And, 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 um, and, you know, you have to rely on your friends and, the, and your own best judgments. Okay. Thank you. So we have another question. What's the aim of what you write? What do you want to really say to the people who read and read you? Should reporting aid or should be objective? But I wonder if it's difficult to be objective about such a topic. Uh, I appreciate the question. And it's it's not difficult to be objective, though, like I said earlier, it's inevitably my own bias will enter peace just through the way I'm looking at the world as much as I try to eliminate all, all bias and uh, subjectivity. Um, I think that 
when I write longer feature magazine stories, I want people to understand that despite human tragedy, there's still a lot of willpower for people to overcome that adversity and th those hardships. Um, and that despite, um, you know, criminal elements or, or poverty or um, all these things that are playing against the common, uh, you know, people of a place or a certain area or, um, or a network, they are, they're doing their best and people are always just doing the best that they can. Um, and that there's, there's arguments for every side. There's arguments for why the Islamic State did what it was doing, why the Islamic State is still as big as it is today. There's arguments for why they shouldn't be that big. Um, I do try to step down the middle and be objective and, and show all sides so that at the end of the day, what you read is something that you can take away from um, your own pers personal objective, subjective opinion, um, your own personal take, your own understanding of, of the situation. Um, I could do my best to give you all the information. I can do my best to make sure that that information is factual and accurate and checked by not only myself, but uh, half a dozen other people, um, experts in the fields and editors. Um, but ultimately you'll take away what you will. Um, I, I said earlier in this talk that, um, that to understand, to read more and to understand more about the world is one way to generate story ideas, but it's also one way to give yourself more um, ammunition to understanding the world and not feeling so cloistered or, or certain about something, because you should never be certain. You should always be seeking different sides, different answers and different questions, um, because there is no right way. There is no, uh, there is no um, perfect approach. There is no you know, objectivity writ large, but you can do your best to walk that line and, and show all the sides so that what people can walk away with is, is something of a bigger picture rather than so narrow-minded and, and, and hyper-focused on one or two things that um, in the broader scheme are, are not very relevant. Okay, we have um, another question. How can you describe seeing ordinary people used to live in that clim climate of terror and violence? I appreciate the question. I think um, I think what you're asking is, what's it? What's it? Um, people used to living in that climate of terror and violence. It's not much. It's not much different. Um, in fact, I found more gracious attitudes and more wholesome uh, welcomings in Iraq and Syria than I ever did in America. Um, if I go knock on a door in America to ask someone for an interview, they'll call the cops on me. Um, in Iraq or Syria, they'll offer tea and welcome me into their home. And and I think what I was saying earlier to uh, the previous question was that you know human strife is 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 real and it's everywhere, um, but people's ability to overcome that is astounding. Uh, everything that can inflict a, upon a person and, and they are still alive and surviving is, is, is amazing. And time and again, people in these countries are, uh, who are ravaged by war, uh, by other countries warring and fighting and, and trying to claim different territory or, or, or whatever political motives, find the, the goodness in themselves or the situation to, to do better work or to, to, um, to, to save the lives of other people. Um, you know, I think in a sense, um, a lot of people live in terror throughout their lives, but um, the only way through that is is forward, and 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 people always find a way. Thank you. Well, talking about um, Syria and Iraq, um, well, I think um, well, these two states uh, are going to to be in the the next month. Uh, but right now there is the war, but also the COVID-19 pandemic. So there are they're really involved in a lot of problems. So what do you think uh, it, it will be? It will it will be of uh, these two states. Well, I think I think I can't really speak to the future. Um, I wish I could for a lot of things, but I I think what we're seeing in a lot of countries uh, we see this in the Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Beirut. We see. Um, the Uyghur population uh, detainees in, in China, um, these small cloistered uh, areas of refugees and, and internally displaced persons are very susceptible to these outbreaks, um, much like a prison population would, right? Because they're all so close together. Um, and I know that it's a very difficult time for a lot of international organizations and NGOs who, um, who are trying to reach these people and provide health, um, but they just simply don't have the same uh, medical institutions and uh, readily available 
uh, doctors the way we do um, uh, elsewhere. So it's 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 always in the back of my mind worried that these countries will you know um, be another tinderbox for uh, either civil violence or, or or the pandemic because of their inability to get these uh, this medical attention. Um, but uh, as far as political m moves go, I, I'm not really sure where where Trump stands anymore with with Syria. Um, we were in, then we were out, then we were sort of in, and we're sort of just protecting the oil or something. Um, so it's it's hard to say what the future is. And the pandemic has really taken over the news cycle. Um, the stories about these people and and people who are internally displaced or trying to return to their country, uh, whether it be the refugees in Iran trying to get back to their home in Afghanistan or these Syrian refugees in um, in Lebanon, it's it's just a terrible situation. And um, you know, whatever we can do to support as the reading public to find these stories and seek them out, despite all the coronavirus coverage, um, will shed more light on them. Okay. Piccolo momento in italiano, come al solito ricordo che è possibile fare domande dal pubblico e le porremo al nostro ospite. Yeah, in the meantime, do you have any suggestion if someone of us here uh, listening wants to become a war reporter? I told uh, I told you guys off stage uh, not to do it. I said, uh, don't go into journalism. It's a tough business. Um, but uh, if you do want to go into journalism, I think, um, you know, writing as much as you can now for your student newspaper. Do you guys have a student newspaper? Like a student yeah, website? There. There are a lot of students' newspaper. Right. So starting starting there, starting to write as much as you can, uh, pitching um, these bigger national newspapers. Um, um, you know, I, I'd butcher all the names, but pitching L'Espresso, pitching um, uh, La Repubblica, all these places to try and get your name out there, or just to meet with editors who are willing to to take a chance on you and, and publish some of your work is a, is a, is a great way in. Um, it's sort of one of those industries where you have to pry a lot and, and, and be the annoying person that's always in someone's inbox. Um, so I, if you want to be a journalist, if you want to be a writer, um, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of uh, fortitude um, and perseverance, but at the end it, it's worth it. Um, but if, uh, if you're having any doubts, I just say just quit and, and try something different because it's, it's tough. Thank you. Well, uh, Laura asked uh, ask you, is there any any event that, sorry, is there any event you've lived or witnessed that most had on, an impact on you, being it positive or negative? Would you mind telling us about it? Um, I think just one of the events I note in the book, um, well, there were two events I note in the book uh, that sort of are in line with um, negative impacts on me or positive impacts on me. Um, one of which was a uh, time when I was interviewing um, people who were returning to their bombed out village in Syria. Um, and I was wearing a bulletproof vest and asking them, you know, how does it feel to be safe and, and free and, and, and um, outside of the rule of the Islamic State? Um, and I felt weird asking that question because I was still wearing a bulletproof vest and still had protection and, and men with guns around me uh, protecting me. Um, and so the question was sort of uh, disconnected from the reality of, of it's still not that safe. It's still not a, a place where people will easily return to and, and live happily ever after. Um, so I think that was a sort of a, a learning lesson for me as a reporter that um, I need to take into account that there is a sort of privilege for my being there um, and to them letting me in to tell their stories. Um, so that's one thing that I've taken uh, onto other assignments with me as well. Um, and also, just more broadly speaking, not necessarily one um, one event, but you know, dealing with um, fixers and 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 colleagues, I've never been a very good communicator. And trying to get my emotions and feelings across on paper is very easy for me, but in speaking, it's not. So I've I've have had a difficulty um, articulating my own fear or my own worry or um, where that comes from or or my discomfort in a situation or with people. Um, and broaching that and having a, an open conversation about it. And that has led to more problems. My inability to communicate has led to more problems um, than, than possibly all the, the, the guns that were shot at me. Um, so 
being able to connect with people and and speak your speak your voice and your opinion um, directly and 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 wholesomely and with honesty is is so much more valuable than um, you know a bulletproof vest or PPE. Um, and so I've tried to take that as well with me on my reporting and, and my day to day life. So thank you for the question. Yeah, we have another question. Question: uh, Did you have any trouble publishing your work about war, like some kind of political pressure to not reveal what's going on? No, I haven't. I've uh, been very fortunate to work for um, some high caliber magazines in, in the United States. Um, Sophia mentioned a few of them earlier, and um, I've never had anything that I've, I've I've discovered or come across suppressed. No one's ever asked me to withhold information. Um, there have been times when I had to call maybe the State Department, um, which is sort of like our um, interior ministry, um, to ask them if they had a comment on a certain thing um, that I had discovered. And, and they asked if I could wait for a little bit before I publish so that they can respond or that they can check with their sources to see if, if, if they have anything else that they can add to the report. So there have been times when I've communicated with the government to say, here's something that we're going to publish. Here's something that I've, I've discovered. Do you have anything you want to add or say before it goes up? And, and that's the sort of common dialogue you have with sources and with, with governments and institutions to maintain that objective, to objectivity so that all sides, all parties have a voice. Um, but I haven't ever had anything killed that was because of a political agenda or um, strict, struck, struck from the record because it wasn't, um, wasn't what the publication wanted to publish now. Right. Well, mm, you've been in Iraq, Syria. Was you, where will you go next? Northern Italy. <laughs> Northern Italy. Just stay here in well, Northern I have, Italy. Uh, yeah, I have, um, I'm working on a few uh, big stories out of um, Northern Italy um, about the coronavirus um, that I'll hopefully publish later this year. Um, so I'm, I'm here for the foreseeable future and, and, and working on coronavirus-related stories, yeah. Mm, Benedetta is asking, well, she's asking what, what I just asked about right now. <laughs> Um, um, well, no, it's, it's fair. I mean, I don't, I don't usually talk about much of, of the stories I'm working on just for uh, security reasons and also for competition reasons. Um, but uh, mostly, you know, it's, it's a tough market for a lot of things to publish right now, but I'm looking on the effects of coronavirus in Northern Italy and, um, and possibly Northern Africa. So a few stories coming out in magazines by the end of the year, but um, most of it's coronavirus related. Um, Agnese asks, uh, may you make a comparison between American and Italian journalism? Um, they're both written with words. Um, I think there's, uh, I think the Italian journalism that, I, that I've read is very, um, very stringent and very good. Um, there's a lot of good reporting from the very outset um, about the coronavirus. There's been... Um, a wealth of knowledge about um, the own country's history of cholera and pandemics dating back to time immemorial, um, in memoriam. And uh, I don't think there's a real comparison between American and Italian journalism um, that's negative. I think there's a difference as far as what American publications are interested in, what Italian publications are interested in. Uh, America is by and large a very uh, insular nation and so goes it for its American media public. Um, you know, anything that isn't America related or America centric um, doesn't interest Americans or, or, or the American publications most of the time. Um, that's not um, that's not a rule. Uh, but there's a there's a need, I think, in Italy for greater narrative nonfiction. Um, you know, storytelling that goes deeper into um, uh, you know news events or. Um, you know, actually, Lorenzo, I forget his last name, over at The Guardian, who's the Italian correspondent, really does some incredible long-form journalism in The Guardian about Italy. Um, and I'd like to see in the future Italian publications doing more of that. Panorama does some really good work. Um, but there isn't really a, a solid, continuous venue for long-form narrative nonfiction like we see uh, in the States. 
Yeah, so if we don't have any other questions, we would like to thank you very much for being so, to share with us your experience, your knowledge to answer to all our questions. We really appreciate that and we really thank you. So um, we invite all our uh, guests and public to follow the next days and tonight, the next event of Not Bianche. And thank you very much, Ken and Guillermo as well. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ken.